Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traversing the Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. And as always, hit that subscribe button, everybody. An amazing show for you, because board the mothership is J. Paul Bamer. You know him from multiple Star Trek roles, such as Mestral. He now plays the Krill High Priest in the Orville. Now come join me as we go Traversing the Stars. Hello, Paul. Thank you so much for coming to the Traversing the Stars podcast. Thank you for having me. It's totally my pleasure, sir. I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you've done. You've been in two of the best franchises, Star Trek and uh, the Orville. So, congratulations. <laughs> thank you very much. It's a big life accomplishment for me. A big dream come true. Well, it, it, those franchises really are some <clears throat> of the most beloved franchises. I mean, the fan base for both is extremely dedicated. Um, the renew the Orville uh, hashtag goes is crazy popular right now on Twitter. It, it, it must be quite a thing to be part of those two franchises. Yeah, it, for me, it really is. I, I grew up a big Star Trek fan, so it was kind of like a dream come true when, when I got the first job on Star Trek. I uh, sort of felt really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> lucky to get any work, but really lucky to get on to a show that I was such a fan of growing up. So what inspired you, your love for acting and who were your earliest influences? Um, gosh, I, when I was little, I, we just grew up watching black and white movies on TV when there were three networks and maybe a PBS station. Um, but we watched black and white movies and I just fell in love with them. And, um, my big inspiration growing up was Olivier, um, because he was so powerful and commanding and, um, did classic theater, which I was trained in. Um, and which I did have done for a lot of my career. I've done a lot of regional theater and Shakespeare and other plays that they do regionally. Um, so that was, that was pretty much the big impetus for my getting involved. So what was it about acting that you think sparked that interest in you? Was it the imagination of being these, um, these new worlds? Was it different being different people? What was it? I think it was... Partly because I was so interested in classical theater, I think it was the interest in being part of something that was bigger than myself. And, mm. and especially classical writing was, the ideas were so huge and kind of beyond the scope of what I was exposed to growing up mm. uh, that it kind of fueled my imagination and kind of allowed me to step outside myself and be someone else, you know? Mm. I mean, your, your background in acting is amazing. You apprenticed at the Kenley Players, attended Kilgore Junior College. You attended Southern Methodist University and University of Delaware, all for acting. That, that's a lot of past post high school acting education. So what was the, the reasoning for that? And what was the development, the development like throughout those schools? Well, I, uh, first of all, Kenley Players, uh, that was a theater that kind of did 10 musicals a summer, and they would move them through uh, three or four cities in the Midwest. I don't know if you know about, or if your listeners know about them. Uh, John Kenley ran a theater. He ran, he did 10 musicals. Uh, they toured in the summer to three big cities, uh, Dayton, uh, someplace in Michigan, I think Flint, and someplace else. Um, and the big draw was they got really, at that time, big people. They had um, Tim Conway was there the season I was there, uh, Martha Ray, Margaret Whiting. I got to meet Rosemary Clooney, um, Dottie West. Gosh, who well, there were so many, so many people. And I actually, Dudley Moore was dating Susan Anton, who was in the season I was in. So he showed up. So that was like a huge deal. Yeah. And for me, uh, I was 16. Uh, I saw this ad in the paper uh, for a job at a theater. And I thought that would be fantastic. A kid in Dayton, Ohio. And 
suddenly I was going to get to do my dream. And what was going on at that time in the country was we were in a huge auto crunch uh, and no people were not working. So I'm 16, I showed up in downtown Dayton and there was a line six blocks long of just people interviewing so they could get a job. Mm. Um, and I'm 16 and there were three jobs available. And I thought, well, this will be fun. So I met them and I left and my family went to visit other family in Kentucky for the weekend. And I thought, well, that's not gonna happen. I got back, I got the job. So it was really exciting. I got to meet uh, Barry, um, oh God, what was his name? Greg Brady. Very cool. Yeah, he played Tony in West Side Story. Anyway, and from then uh, we moved to Texas. I got, uh, finished my high school there in my junior year, I competed in uh, UIL one act drama. And the guy who was the judge was the director of the program at Kilgore Junior College, which is famous for the oil strike in the late 20s, early 30s, and also Van Cliburn, mm. who uh, secreted himself into Russia and won the Tchaikovsky competition. Um, and I got a call the next week from uh, Raymond Caldwell, who ran it, and said, I got a scholarship for you if you want. And I said, I can't come. I'm a junior. And he goes, no worries. I'll hold it for you for the next year. So. I called him up the next year and I said, I don't know if you remember me. And he said, yeah, I remember you. The scholarship's open and here you go. So I, I went to college for two years for free and got paid. Um, and it was really exciting because I had academic classes, of course, but my the real thrust of it for me was theater. I got to play Stanley and Streetcar Named Desire, The Cowardly Lion. Nice. Um, Tartuffe and Tartuffe. Um, I had a really good two years there. And, and then I got accepted to Southern Methodist University as a transfer, one of two students. Uh, and I got a Greer Garson scholarship while there. And uh, at the end of my time there, it was really big uh, at that time, industry-wide. And also I was a little scared to go to New York at the time uh, for people to get a graduate degree because that led to the next thing, getting an agent and all of that. And so I took a year off in Dallas and got accepted to uh, University of Delaware, where uh, the professional theater training program and uh, did three years there, got my master's and went right to New York and never stopped working. That's awesome. So I want to know a little bit more about Kenley Players and, and doing a musical. So sure. did you have a great voice uh, or did you learn to sing? Well, like <laughs> That, that's a good question. That It's a great question. I did musicals in high school in Texas. Uh, that job was basically pushing sets and ironing clothes and loading scenery into the, uh, the fly rail system and putting weights on the fly rail system to, to lever them up and down. And it, it was really, I was an apprentice actor. So doing all the things you do to learn how the mechanism of theater works, but also watching from the wings as these amazing people went on stage. I, I particularly remember Helen O'Connell, who was a girl singer in the day. And she was, you know, she was working, but she was an old lady. Mm. And I remember she could barely see in the dark. And we had to escort, I had to escort her from the wing dressing room to the, the stage. And she was slow walking. And I held her in my, I gave her my arm and walked her to the stage. She held on to me, she didn't want to fall. The minute they announced her name and the light came up, she was a 20 year old girl, walked <laughs> out on stage and just sang the crap out of everything. She was, a, <laughs> but it was fun. Cause I got to watch how people stepped up to the occasion. It was really mm -hmm. exciting. So, like I said, you worked with some very famous people. Like I said, as you mentioned, Rosemary Clooney. Um, as someone who's watching these great actors do their job or go about their craft, did you notice something different about them that other people who maybe not would not go on to become successful didn't have? Gosh. Um, that's a good question. I, I, I really... I think 
I think the, the, the big thing I noticed was their ability to step up to the task at hand mm. at any given moment, particularly with Helen O'Connell. I mean, that was, that was amazing to see that transformation occur. And uh, I also, the thing about Rosemary Clooney, she was from Dayton and Cincinnati. Mm. And people would show up at uh, the time between the afternoon and the evening. And she sat in her dressing room and she let people come in and talk to her and sign off. She really was there for the fans and really appreciated them and gave them the time of day. And I think that really spoke volumes about who she was and who she was for them and who they were for her. That's also, I, I'm, I'm currently reading a book by um, William Davis, B, B. Davis. The, uh, he talks about acting and things of that nature and how some actors, um, he, he describes that some actors have to stay in the dark before they perform and others are very gregarious before their scenes. So I find that interesting, like why actors choose different things. So when you're doing your thing, do you find yourself being someone who, you know, before the scene stays in the dark, as you would describe it, or someone who jumps in and is friendly off and can just snap in when it's time to play your part? It depends on the role and it depends on the play. And it also depends on what you're doing at the time. Like if you're in tech rehearsal, where it's just figuring out the lights and stuff and it's very slow, there's more time to, to fool around. But when you're in the thrust of a show and you gotta get going, I'm pretty focused and, mm. um, I mean, I can have a laugh, but I'm pretty focused and, at the task. So you, you performed in numerous Star Trek series and video games. What, yeah. what, is, what does the franchise has, has meant to you? And as you're doing it, do you feel the embrace of the fan base? Because the one thing about Star Trek fans, and I think the same, same with the Orville, maybe in Star Wars, every actor who does anything in the franchise is remembered and loved, it seems like, for their entire lives. I mean, have you noticed that kind of like embrace, uh, being embraced by that level of fandom when, when you do those parts? Yeah, I think, yeah, I, yeah, I have. Uh, I've gone to a few conventions. That's been really fun for, for Star Trek. That's been a while. Mm. Um, and people are always so generous and kind and really, <laughs> oddly enough, I say oddly enough because I'm just not used, thankful <laughs> for, for, the, for the work I did, which just feels freaking great. Um, <laughs> But people are just very generous. And I, I remember uh, when I, when the killing game first happened and then drone kind of shortly thereafter, I, people were really, they recognized me on the street and were just very nice and sweet and kind. And that's nice, it's nice. So for what has the convention experience been like for you? I. I go to um, frequent conventions where I live, you know, usually it's around Comic-Con, Trificon, Boston Comic-Con. Right. And it's so cool from, cause I'm always on the, I'm usually always on the outside, you know, going for the autographs. And it, from a fan, it's cool being there and getting the autograph and meeting the celebrity. What's it like for you seeing these fans come to you and want your signature on, on their fit photos and other things? It's really cool. <laughs> but, you know, the, the other thing about going to the conventions, I mean, of course, it's fun to do the, the signing and talk to people and um but but one thing two things really stand out um i i was i did a convention in pasadena and this kid came up and he he, he clearly was on the uh spectrum mm. and he couldn't look he couldn't look anybody in the eye and he, he could barely talk but he came up to me and he picked a picture and he he set it down for me and then he looked up and he wouldn't stop talking he just felt totally free mm. and his mom instantly apologized she said it, it, he just does that please don't. i said are you kidding <laughs> this is this is amazing that he's able to do this he was wearing a a starfleet uniform and i said he this is amazing that this gives him the freedom to step up and step out. And I said, let him go on. It's I'll be, I'll be here for him. It's great. Mm. But then I'm a fan guy. So I got to meet Arlene Martell and, oh. and um, she was to Pring, right? I think, I believe so. I believe so. I think that was Arlene. I, yeah. And I got to meet her and that was like, I got to sit next to her. I got to talk. I was like, I was like a pig and you know what, it was great. <laughs> 
it, 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 must, it must be like a hell of an experience. Um, because of the fan base and because the fan base memory is so dedicated and their memories are so long, do you feel added pressure performing in those franchises? No, not really. Because mostly what I'm doing is trying to do my job and mm. not mess up anything. <laughs> <laughs> And it goes so fast. I mean, the shooting day is really, really fast. Um, and in fact, the uh, the last episode of the Orville I was on, we shot just, they shot that episode and finished it. We were the fourth episode for the season, the first episode to complete shooting. And it was very, it was very strange because I think they were shooting another episode with the set of Bruce Boxleitner and... Lisa Baines, who is sadly no longer with us. Um, they were shooting another episode at the same time with everybody. So they were doing a lot of things. So I shot for two days and then I came back three weeks later to shoot one more day. Um, so it's all very fast and sometimes very far apart. Um, so mostly I was just trying to mm. get my job done and fulfill what the story needed. Now, now, a lot of characters um, from Star Trek and Orville get cards, training cards made of them, and action figures. Do you have one of yours? I have cards. I don't have action figures. Not yet, though. <laughs> not, not, not yet. We'll see. So we'll how see. cool is it to have a trading card with, with your face on it? Pretty cool. <laughs> fun. It's fun. That's, that's, that's like the pinnacle. I mean, there's one thing about being in a, in a TV or a movie, but, but now you got merchandise with yourself on it. <laughs> kind of weird, right? <laughs> <laughs> so so what do you think is about you that has done so well and has been chosen so often to play aliens and villains? Well, oddly enough, I'll, I'll just tell you this. Um, Ron Sarma, who cast... Uh, Star Trek, who's now a very dear friend um, in my life. Um, I had just come to LA to do a, a play that I'd done in New York and we'd moved it out here. And then I left to do a play in Boston that transferred, uh, Seattle that transferred to Boston. And I had a month off in between uh, the transfer and I was here in LA again. And I got a call from my agent and said, Have, I got something for you. You got to get to Paramount. It's going to make you really happy. And I said, what is it? He goes, it's Star Trek. And I had to pull over the car because I was super excited. <laughs> um, it was my first real big audition. And I, I walked in. I drove onto the Paramount lot. I, I went to the audition and, and I met Ron. And I did the audition for him. And... I left and uh, I got a call back the next day. And that's not true. I got a, I left and then I got a call from my agent saying, where are you? And I said, I'm on my way home. And he goes, you got to get back to Paramount. So I went back to Paramount and I had a call back. Wow. And I got the part. And Ron told me later that they'd been looking for this young Nazi <laughs> and they couldn't find a guy that they liked. And he said, I knew the minute I, I knew the first three words out of your mouth, you were the guy. <laughs> like the callback. And he said, he said, and I sat in the callback with you. And I was, he was between me and the director and the producers. And he said, the minute we started, I could feel the director smile behind me. And he said, he said, you had it the minute you walked in the room. So I was very, I was very lucky. So very lucky. Uh, like I said, I don't know what that means that you saw you first thought it was Nazi. <laughs> well, I'm a hundred percent German background. So right. <laughs> that's part of it. I also speak some German. I'm not fluent, but I, I do speak some German. And also at the time I was playing a British soldier in a 19th century play. Mm. So I had that military bearing. Mm. And my classical training really played into the kind of writing that they do on, on Star Trek. So mm. all of it kind of conspired to uh, <laughs> lend myself to that. Well, that's awesome. And, and you played perhaps uh, one of your most beloved performance in Star Trek as, 
I might get to pronounce it wrong, Mestral? Yeah. Mestral and Star Trek Enterprise. So how did you approach the role of a Vulcan who was learning the ways of humanity? How do you approach the character arc in the episode? Um, that was really interesting. I, 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 to me though, the character of Mestral is similar to the character of one, completely different, but similar in the sense that they're both so open to what's around them and not, mm. not kind of, I mean, he's a Vulcan, Mestral, but he was very inquisitive and very curious about the world around him. And he didn't shut things out because of a preordained thought pattern or mm. habit of being logical and a Vulcan. Um, so that, that's how I approached it. And, and the, the, the character just sort of made sense. It just made sense to me. It spoke to me. Mm -hmm. And also we were shooting for the first couple of days, we shot on location in Big Bear. So that was like, we were all like, and it was their first uh, episode after hiatus. I know it was later in the, the season, but it was the first episode they shot after hiatus. So everybody was super excited and super awake and not exhausted from mm -hmm. the 22 episodes they just shot and had right. four more to go. Um, so we all kind of bonded on like a, Boy Scout, Girl Scout camp, because we were all in Big Bear. It was fun. Right, right. So when you're playing, I mean, the Vulcans are so iconic. You know, I mean, not just if you're a Star Trek fan, but I mean, even if you're not a fan of Star Trek and you don't even know Star Trek, just so you know that the word Vulcan. And Everybody knows Vulcan. Right, right, right. And everybody knows Spock. But, right, exactly. You know Spock. Um, you know, they're, they're extremely well known. So when you're playing a Vulcan, you have a character, iconic character like Spock, you know, Sarek, all them. Um, do you look for them for inspiration? Is it hard to look at them for inspiration and not try to do your own thing? How, how do you work, like thread that needle? For me, as a huge fan of the show, um, I just really kept thinking of Leonard Nimoy. And uh, something really kind of amazing happened when I got the part. I, I auditioned again for Ron Sarma. And he, he brought me, he wanted to pre-read me to give me kind of notes because they were having trouble finding the guy again. Uh, and for this particular role, I think I auditioned eight times for the director. It was a very rigorous audition process. Uh, and I think because, I think because they, they felt like it was a kind of a a very important transformational episode for the show mm. itself, but also they they knew that I think this was an important character to fulfill. And I was playing opposite Jolene and Michael Krawick. Um, and when I got the part, uh, I had to show up for an ear fitting with Michael Westmore, whose father did Betty Davis and Joan Crow. I mean, mm. talk about Hollywood royalty. Um, and I showed up and I had a really nice chat with Michael and, and he said, okay, let's, let's get to it. And he pulled out a tray with, I think three or four ears and he's put one on and he said, no, 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 that's too small. And then he pulled another one on and he said, no, 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 that's, that's too big. A little bit of Goldilocks here. Yeah. And then he pulled the third or the fourth out and he put it on and he said, hmm. Those are Leonard's. Oh, very cool. And I thought I literally got chills. I, I literally got chills. And I, I actually have a set of my ears somewhere too far away to get right now. <laughs> I have them. Um, and that's sort of oddly enough, when you put the, the ears on, everything just kind of falls into place. When you're looking, thinking about character arcs, um, you know, from a character who's a Vulcan to eventually um, coming more human as the story goes on, you have characters in Star Trek who follow a similar arc like Data, but he had seasons upon seasons to develop that arc. You had 42 minutes to develop your character's arc. So how did you approach it? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, a lot, first of all, a lot of it is in the writing. I mean, the script was 
really tight and really well written. Um, so everything, everything you want to look for about where the, the arc of the thing is, was right there. Um, especially my favorite line, I love Lucy is on tonight. I mean, <laughs> it was such a touchstone for, for a number of reasons. Number one, that was an extremely popular show in its time. Mm. And just the, the shot that was set up about him watching the TV and what was going on in the news at that time. And then to go, and I love Lucy is on tonight. That, that was kind of like, this guy's so open to what's in front of him, which is really kind of what a scientist is. Right, right, right. right. You gotta be like, what's this? What's this? This is really cool. Um, so the writing was really good. And I, I also had, I was very blessed because I got to work with really great people. Annie Cusack, Michael Croick, and Jolene. I mean, and everybody was so generous on set. It was just terrific. So the arc just seemed very clear, something I could really, I just knew right away. I wonder if the Lu I Love Lucy is also referenced to Lucille Ball, who many credit for uh, saving Star Trek. Of course. Uh, as one of the producers. Absolutely. This one, a little nod to that as well, which is very clever. Nice little Easter egg. Absolutely. <laughs> So that, I mean, that's awesome. And you, um, another great role that you have is um, you played the Krill High Priest in Orville. So how did you get involved with that? Uh, luck. I, <laughs> uh, everything's luck. I mean, everything's luck. Hmm. Um, I, <laughs> oddly enough, I was on jury duty. <laughs> uh, and I was an alternate. And my agent at the time called me and said, I've got, uh, got an audition for you for the Orville. And I said, that's great. I, I can't go. I'm in jury duty. And he goes, can you do it on your lunch hour? And I said, I'll check. So I went and I checked with the judge. I asked the bailiff if I, if I could ask the judge a question and he said, give me a minute because it was lunch break. I went in. We were just about to go back into court. And there I am in the galley area not in the witness box but uh, in the uh, jury box but in the galley area with the defendant and the prosecutor and the judge and the bailiff and the judge goes so uh i hear you want to audition and i said yeah it's yeah i do and he goes why and i said well i'm an alternate uh it's a very big deal it's a job that could recur it would give me a several episodes uh, I did not get this particular role. Mm. Uh, and he goes, How, what would it mean to your life? And I think he was doing this for the defendant. And I said, it would be life-changing if I got it. Because getting mm. two or three episodes on a TV show in one year, it's a big deal at, at where I am in my career. Um, and he goes, okay, see you the day after tomorrow. So he let me out. And I went. And I knew that Seth was a big fan of Star Trek. Yeah. And I took one of my cards uh, from one. And I got there, I did the audition and um, I was good. I was also doing a play at the time at night. So I was going from downtown LA to uh, further down south, which since you're in Rhode Island, you don't know, but <laughs> a 20 mile trip can take two hours here sometimes. <laughs> um, so I was tired, but I was like, going to do this audition. And I went and I nailed the audition. I wasn't the guy they were looking for, but Seth goes, that was really good, man. And I said, um, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I know you're a big fan of the show. And so I brought this for you. And I gave him my baseball card of one. Yeah. And he goes, dude, who is that? Who's this guy? <laughs> and I said, that's uh, one. It was seven of nine's baby. And uh, so he was really sweet. And he brought me back in I think two or three more times. And finally I booked the uh, Navarian ambassador mm. and uh, yeah. And then they brought me back in for the Krill for the second season. And then they carried that over into this past season. That's awesome. So you've played um, in your career, both the Nazi and Star Trek, as we mentioned, and also the Krill High Priest. Mm -hmm. So in approaching these characters, do you think that they, or did you approach them as if they possessed a similar mindset 
And what was your approach to playing the krill? The approach to playing the krill, I mean, they, I guess they do have a similar mindset, but the approach to playing the krill or anything really is, I mean, if, if you're a bad guy, let's say you are a bad guy, you're not going to think you're a bad guy. You're thinking you're kind of like a good guy and mm. you're doing the right thing. So, you know, you want to keep that in mind. So it's not just you know, twisting the mustache and rah, rah, rah. Right, but, right. Uh, yeah, so yeah. And it was also interesting this season because we were involved in that election thing going on, which was very prescient. Right, so. right. <laughs> and like I said, the krill really became like one of the fundamental best, you know, like species in Orville. I mean, right. they're, they're, I mean, like in Star Trek, you have the Klingon, the Vulcan, but right now in the word of Orville, it's the krill. Right. So once again, so what is that like for you to be part of something that large? Did you research what the krills were within Orville? Were you already familiar with the Orville? Uh, because I'd done the two episodes previous, I was sort of familiar. And I had I'd watched a few episodes in the first season. Um, and then the pandemic happened. Um, so I... Uh, I didn't get to watch a lot of the show later because I was doing a show at the time and was very busy, a, a theater show. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of the interesting things about those characters, specifically the Krill and specifically one, and I guess even Mestral, is once you get the latex on and the appliances on, you don't have to do a lot, it's all, kind of right there right right if that makes sense so when you're playing two different characters on one show like i said you played the Navarian ambassador you played the krill high priest is it makes it more is it more complicated of a performance you do you have to be very careful about distinguishing the two characters and or how you physically inhabit those characters because they're these are two characters from one show that people probably will may recognize you as perhaps in both Oddly enough, not 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 so much because the appliances were so different, mm -hmm. and the the the, uh, the wardrobe is so different. So a lot of that takes care of itself because a lot of the wardrobe shapes how you can actually move and carry yourself. If that makes sense. Did Did you think about your voice as well, as just making it distinguishing? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, the the krill is meant to be a little sharper and raspier and i always felt the navari amb ambassador was a little bit more head energy so it was a little bit further up mm. in his body so what well, when you're thinking about star trek and the orville and you once again you, you're familiar with the fan bases do you see similarities across the fan bases between these two franchises i don't even, i don't even know that's a good question i don't know i don't know to be honest with you we uh i have twin toddlers so that's kept me a lot out of the world recently <laughs> um, um so i haven't had much contact with uh fan base stuff but um no i just what i do know is the fans are very dedicated to the, the stories and and they're really kind of after what we're all after aren't they they just want something bigger and the promise of something better down the line mm. if that makes sense no i think it makes total sense so what is next up for you uh right now i am working on auditioning uh i also i'm a i've been very fortunate uh for about 20 years i've been narrating audiobooks um and i say fortunate because i have a studio set up at home uh and i record from home by myself in a box. So if you ever come and you see me yelling at the top of my lungs <laughs> in a dark box that's padded, don't worry. <laughs> um, but the great thing about it is that during the pandemic, when theater and film and television was mostly shut down, I kept working on narrating audiobooks. So I've been very lucky. Very cool. Uh, Paul, it's been a total pleasure to talk with you, sir. You're awesome. And as you're doing more work, please come back on and talk about it. I will. Invite me back. I'll come. <laughs> <laughs>